Six billion dollars. This guy fell from the sky and made six billion dollars. How did he do it? It sounds like clickbait combined with an awful dad joke, where the answer is a play on words or an exaggeration of circumstance. But this is no joke or exaggeration. That's exactly what happened. Austrian skydiver Felix Baumgartner became the first human to break the sound barrier without the help of an engine. On October 12, 2012, he climbed into a tiny silver capsule powered by a helium balloon and rose 24 miles into the sky. 100,000 feet above the ground, Baumgartner soared above the ozone, staring down at the earth beneath him. At max altitude, he swung open the pod's door and stood right on the edge, hands gripping the support rails and toes hanging 10. After a brief pause, he gave a salute then said, then he fell, for 4 minutes to be exact, hitting Mach 1.25 on the way down and breaking the sound barrier with just his body. By the time Baumgartner landed, he'd made history, and so had his sponsor. Red Bull spent over $50 million on their quest to break the record for the highest skydive. It was a project seven years in the making. They recruited experts from every field to make it happen, running practice jumps at lower altitudes. All things considered, it was a remarkable achievement, and the whole world took notice. This one YouTube video of the jump has over 124 million views, still racking up views to this day. Everything that went into the jump, from the engineering to the intense risk, was for one single reason, to sell a carbonated drink. And when you look at it like that, it's kind of funny. This stunning achievement of science and human resilience happened for such an insignificant reason. It'd be like Burger King coordinating a Mars landing to promote chicken fries. But despite the absurdity, it worked. Economists estimate that Red Bull generated $6 billion in revenue thanks to the Stratos project, a number that will only increase with time. That's one of the unique advantages of owning a world record. Anytime the event is discussed, Red Bull profits. When it comes to the genius of Red Bull, this is the tip of the iceberg. Most people don't know this, but Red Bull doesn't make anything. I know that sounds insane, but it's true. Red Bull is an Austrian marketing firm who's gotten almost too good at their job, creating the largest energy drink brand in the world. Today, we're going to take an inside look at Red Bull. We'll discuss their origins, marketing, why they make nothing, and how they're going to take over the world. Before inventing Red Bull, Chileo Uvita was a duck farmer. Born to a poor Chinese immigrant family in northern Thailand, Chileo first found success importing antibiotics and other pharmaceuticals. He did this for a couple years before starting his own company, TC Pharmaceuticals. Throughout the 1960s, TC held its own and stood as a solid business. But in the 1970s, everything changed after Chileo came to a shocking revelation. Thailand's energy drink market made no sense. At this point, energy drinks didn't exist in the West, not in Europe, not in the United States, nowhere. But in Thailand, it was a booming market. But the problem was, they were expensive, and viewed as a product for the rich man, not the working class man. Chileo thought this was backwards. Why market to the rich when it's the working man who needs an extra kick? Growing up in poverty, Chileo understood the amount of work it took just to get by. That had to be the perfect crowd to buy energy drinks. He studied his competitors' formulas and found they all had four shared ingredients, taurine, caffeine, glucose, and sucrose. After deciding on the ingredients, he started to think about branding. He wanted something which represented Thailand, but also the working class man. After thinking it over, he went with the guar, a type of bovine indigenous to Southeast Asia. Built of pure muscle, the guar stands at 6 feet tall and weighs over 3,000 pounds. They're not the most agile of creatures, but Chileo found inspiration in their power and ability, featuring two red guars charging toward each other amidst a bright yellow sun on the front of his cans. He named his new drink Crating Dang, which translated means red guar. Crating Dang hit the shelves hard. Within two years, it became Thailand's most popular energy drink. This happened for two reasons. First off, Crating Dang was cheaper than any energy drink on the market. On top of this, Chileo also marketed to the right crowd. Factory workers, truck drivers, anyone who performed labor. Because of this, he built a strong, consistent consumer base. But Red Bull may have never left Thailand, if it weren't for a certain toothpaste salesman. In the 1980s, a man named Dietrich Maitschitz worked for a company called Blendax, in which he was a marketing director. But nothing about him screamed marketing genius right off the bat. 
It took him 10 years to graduate from Vienna University, and after that, he sold laundry detergent at Unilever before ending up at the toothpaste company. But his future as a businessman was about to change forever. In 1982, Dietrich traveled to Bangkok for a business meeting. It was with a company who carried their products, TC Pharmaceuticals. When Dietrich arrived for the meeting, he was jet lagged and worn out. Chaleo took notice of this and offered him a glass of Crating Dang. Dietrich accepted, and within minutes, his jet lag was gone, and he was hooked. From that moment on, every time he went to Bangkok, Dietrich always stopped and grabbed a Crating Dang on the way to his hotel room. But one day, his perception of the drink completely changed. While browsing a business magazine, he came across a company called Taisho Pharmaceuticals. They manufactured drinks and other medicinal products, just like Chileo's company. But here's where it gets interesting. Taisho Pharmaceuticals, at the time, was Japan's largest taxpayer. This caught Dietrich's attention, and his eyes turned to dollar signs. If Taisho could become a giant company, why couldn't Crating Dang do the same thing? Dietrich called Chileo and proposed a business opportunity. What if they both worked together to create a westernized Crating Dang? He pitched that Chileo could handle production, while he manned marketing and distribution. Chileo agreed, and they hit the ground running. The first thing they did was change the name, since the average person doesn't know what a red guar is. But the name turned out to be the least of their problems. At this point, canned soda was huge in the West, with Coca-Cola and Pepsi already dominating the industry. However, there was no established market for energy drinks, which meant one thing. Investors hated them, and pretty much laughed in their faces. They argued that the market wasn't lacking, a drink that tasted worse than Coke, was more expensive, and came in smaller cans. They said it was an illogical product, but Dietrich didn't care. It didn't even slow him down a little bit. He responded by investing $500,000 of his own money into Red Bull, and convinced Chileo to do the same. They decided to take 49% of the company each, with the remaining 2% going to Chileo's son, meaning the Uvita family technically owned the company, but agreed Dietrich would run the operations. Now, with secured funding and money in the bank, they were ready to go. Red Bull officially launched on April 1st, 1987. It came in strange, thin cans and costed more than soda. Besides their new name, the most noteworthy change was the addition of carbonation. And a lot of people didn't get it, but this was all part of the plan. Not everyone was meant to get it. Opposite of Chileo, Dietrich envisioned the drink as something for the upper class. He saw immense value in brand perception and market positioning. Dietrich focused on working with Austrian ski resorts, bars, and clubs, targeting the wealthy and adventurous. He also utilized the classic approach of working with college campuses. He'd host parties featuring Red Bull and slap logos all over students' cars. This helped them early on to identify with a rebellious spirit. It also helped establish them as a genuine movement and not just another product. They ended up selling 1 million cans their first year, while also creating and validating a new market. The hardest thing to understand about Red Bull is why they make nothing. Because at face value, that sounds super confusing. But in simplest terms, they outsource everything. Unlike Coca-Cola, there's no such thing as a Red Bull plant or production center. Instead of outright owning a factory, they have and use partners, such as Rausch, their juice supplier. This allows them to focus on what they do best, marketing, which creates an interesting culture within the company because they're so passionately devoted to getting Red Bull as much attention as possible, but at the same time are so disconnected from the product itself. This helps understand why Red Bull's empire is so vast and far-reaching. This is only scratching the surface, but here's a quick rundown of the Red Bull conglomerate. They have a clothing line, a travel agency, esports teams, a NASCAR team, soccer teams, an ice hockey team, two Formula One teams, a stock music platform, and a career support website, and more. That's a lot for one energy drink brand. And after hearing this, it's easy to view them as a wild, unhinged company that makes nothing while also making everything and spends too much on marketing with little to no focus on a singular project. But that's plain not true. Red Bull is on a cold, calculated mission to take over the world, and they're making tremendous progress. You know how athletes receive money to rep brands? Like how NASCAR drivers have tied on the side of their car? Red Bull does this too, but they take it a step further, and it's this extra step which will allow them to take over the world. 
Instead of sponsoring an event like the Olympics or an Olympic athlete, Red Bull creates their own Olympics. While most companies are happy to invest in media outlets, events, and sports teams, Red Bull opts to host or create the event which gives them so much power in distribution. They control the events, the sports teams, and make sure their products get prime slots. It gets crazier though when you look at their sports teams. Take for example the New York Red Bulls. It might seem silly at first, naming a team after a drink, but it's not as crazy as it sounds. By doing this, they achieve two things. Number one, brand exposure to hundreds of millions of TV viewers. And number two, media mentions week after week. It naturally places their brand name in the conversations of sports fans, without it feeling forced. From there, a fan base around the team starts to grow, and so does Heritage. Once those fans grow old and pass on, their offspring continues the tradition of going to see the New York Red Bulls. The constant exposure to the brand and logo, combined with deep affection for the team, work together to continuously reduce cost per customer. What's absurd is, the New York Red Bulls are just one of of their sports teams. They're creating history and harvesting relevancy in so many areas, not just soccer and not just in physical sports. I used to think the sky was the limit for Red Bull, but Felix Baumgartner proved that was just the start. I'm not sure what the future holds for Red Bull, but I do know one thing. It'll be huge, and they're just getting started. But what do you think? What's the future for Red Bull, and where do you see them 20 years from now? Let me know down in the comments below, check out this next video, and thank you for watching.